I'm speaking with Peter Woodbury, a practicing psychotherapist and an expert on the psychic readings of Edgar Cayce. Edgar Cayce, who lived from 1877 to 1945, gave more than 14,000 such readings over his lifetime on everything from specific health issues to the meaning of life on Earth. Peter, as you know, the name of the show is The Truth About Life, and today we're trying to get at the answers to life's really big questions. So I'm just going to jump right in and do it head first. According to Edgar Casey, what is the true nature of reality? The first thing that comes to mind is um, he talked about um, how time is an artificial construct of this dimension that the uh, encouraged us to uh, uh, ponder the concept of oneness. And he said, don't just spend a day or a week on it. Spend six months pondering what oneness really means. And what he uh, said according to time, he said that time only exists in the earth. In other dimensions of consciousness, everything is one. But we come to experience time because with time comes patience. And that's what we've, uh, from this metaphysical point of view, what we've come, the essential learning in this dimension is to learn patience, to learn that um, things don't happen right when you, you know, when you pray for something, you don't always get it immediately. You have to wait and there's all kinds of tests and challenges that come with that. But through that you grow in faith. It's yeah, a friend of mine once said, be careful what you pray for. He prayed for patience, and then what he got were uh, <laughs> all the opportunities, all the opportunities to learn patience, which yeah. uh, really tested that. And I guess he learned it eventually, but uh, wasn't exactly the way he thought he was going to get it, I suppose. Um, well, reincarnation is part of this, and, yeah, and don't we the... come back many times to learn, to yes. learn patience, to learn yes. to evolve? What? Yes, that was another um, essential kind of message from the Casey material, is that uh, the human soul is eternal, and that we come into this physical experience for a finite time, but that uh, the trick or the key is to keep that eternal awareness in the finite experience and he says that's that continues to be a challenge that uh, you know people uh, he says over the you know millennium of time of people have incarnated that it's become more and more easy to get over identified with the physical and to forget the spiritual and that's why he encouraged us to spend at least 15 minutes a day in silence or in meditation because he says that awakens the spiritual centers that we have that um, make us aware of how much more there is to us, you know, our soul nature. Did he talk at all about how souls came to be? Uh, it's very, uh, a lot of his, um, the, the philosophy of that is common to a lot of religions. You know, there's a, there's a uh, creation mythology from the KC perspective. Um, you've probably heard this before in other contexts. He said that, you know, God uh, desired companionship, you know, as, as Know, complex as that is to understand and, and that souls were created to be companions with God and that God desired that these souls have free will so that they they have a choice to kind of either you know not be with God or to you know he wanted them to be companions out of choosing that you know just like we would all want our partners anybody in our life we want them to be with us through free will so it kind of puts that on God and then through free will these souls began to just experience all of creation and that earth, uh, from this Casey perspective, was a creation, you know, it was part of creation, but it wasn't intended for human, it wasn't intended for soul inhabitation. But through free will, souls began to project themselves into matter. And then Casey has this real interesting uh, idea or, or, you know, series of readings where he talked about um, that as, as uh, souls uh, projected themselves into matter, says the things like uh, walking trees that we've heard about from mythology really existed, and that there were these crossing between these human forms and animal forms like, like minotaurs and the sphinx. He said those were real uh, uh, beings, and that there uh, had to be a process of separating the animal from the human. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that. I'm speaking with Peter Woodbury, a psychotherapist and an expert on the Casey readings. It's Edgar Casey, and we're talking about the meaning of life. Well, Peter, what about Jesus? Don't the readings contain information about Jesus having had past lives? You know, there's a lot about uh, sacred numbers and numerology, and you know, we know that Jesus was 33 when he died, and Casey said he also had about 33 previous lives. So 33 is considered the master number of the spiritual dimension. So it, and, it, and it talked about how um, 
you know, in these different lives, Jesus experienced, you know, all the sorts of, uh, you know, experiences that all of us have in life. You know, all the, the heights and depths. He said, even his, uh, in his um, previous, uh, one of his previous lives, he had been Joshua and had uh, killed people. That that, you know, that, that was part of uh, Jesus's experience, and that his death on the cross as it's popularly depicted as, you know, dying for others, that he was on the cross also for his own past experiences. To settle karma. Right. Were there any other lives besides Joshua, I guess, who the one who fought the Battle of Jericho that mm -hmm. we would recognize? Um, Melchizedek was uh -huh. one of them. And he also said, I mean, this is also kind of a little bit uh, hard to understand, but he said he'd also been Adam. That, that, and that's when, he, when they talk about the Alpha and the Omega, that, again, it goes, there's a, the whole creation mythology uh, when I said that they were these souls that had projected into matter, they had been working with the ape form to, to use that form as the human form. And they kind of talk almost about a, an um, evolution that was driven. It wasn't like you know Darwin completely. It was more like an influenced evolution. And so there were human forms in the earth, but then there was a second influx of souls that came to help these souls that had gotten trapped in the earth. And that was the uh, what Casey calls the Adamic race, and that um, the soul of Jesus came through uh, as Adam and fell, and also just kind of got caught up in the stuff that goes on in this dimension. But he completes his mission. He rose, you know, he, he shows the way out as Jesus. So that's why he says as, he was the Alpha as Adam and the Omega as uh, Jesus. That's interesting. The uh I guess the thing I'm wondering about here is, th is there a difference between the Christ, the Christ consciousness, and Jesus, or are they one and the same? I mean, that, that's a little bit confusing. Yeah, it too. is. And that's actually uh, something I'm exploring for a book because it is so uh, complex. It seems the, the best way I can understand it is that there's God, which is so vast, and then there's the human, which is kind of uh, limited. You know, we have a, a small capacity to really understand the whole and so the intermediary between God and us is this Christ consciousness which in a way that if you read the readings the Christ consciousness is not connected solely to Christianity it's a consciousness that Casey says has been working with every religion you know every kind of spiritual thought especially those with working with the concept of oneness since the beginning of time and that you know that sometimes when we you know the, the readings are considered to be Christian, and if you really understand it, it's much broader. It's talking about a God that is the God of all people, and that uh, Jesus is in a line of kind of spiritual teachers. You know that goes back through all of them. You know that they've all been kind of trying to bring in this uh, God understanding into the earth. So that's maybe a little bit uh, helpful. Um, Casey also talked about how the, the best way we can understand or experience God in the earth is electricity. He says that's kind of the God energy. And it's interesting to think about how electricity can be used to kill or it can be used to heal. And also electricity can, you know, when it kill, it comes in such a high um, voltage that the the Christ is almost the way that, you know, way we deal with electricity. It comes uh, in these, you know, big power centers, and then it has to be kind of reduced so that we're able to use it in our homes. And I think the Christ is that way to kind of manage God's energy into usable uh, forms for us as, uh, as finite humans. Well, that really brings up two questions that I have. Uh, <clears throat> one would be, Casey talked about the creative forces. Right. Mm -hmm. um, was, is God um, a force like like Brahman might be for the Hindus, or is it a, uh, is God a personal God uh, that we can relate to? I mean, that, yeah. well, I would say in a way it's kind of both. I mean, when he was giving readings for people that weren't comfortable with the word God, he would use the word creative force, and when somebody was more comfortable with the concept of God, he would put the God forces. To so kind of uh, put those in some ways as uh, as equal. Mm -hmm. A lot depended on, I mean, even when he would give a physical reading for somebody, uh, I was introduced to the KC material by Harmon Bro, who was sat in on about uh, six months' worth of readings. And um, uh, he noted that uh, there was this odd coincidence that sometimes they would get a series of requests for readings on a particular ailment. And he was there when, when malaria, for some reason, they were just getting 
two weeks worth of like malaria readings. But he was noticing that for some people the prescription was quinine, which is the conventional treatment, and then for some others it was this kind of herbs and things like that. So he was present to ask the question. He said, why for the same ailment are you prescribing these two different treatments? And the answer came back as it often came back, kind of concise but leaving a lot of room for thought. He said, for a quinine mind, you have to prescribe quinine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking with Peter Woodbury, a psychotherapist and an expert on the Casey readings. It's Edgar Casey, and we're talking about the meaning of life. Well, what about uh, evil, the, the subject of evil? Does Satan exist, for example? Is, is well, it certainly exists for Edgar Casey, the man. But then, because Edgar Casey was, you know, almost, he, I think his beginnings was quite fundamentalist. And then he had to, he evolved to kind of a broader understanding of what exactly evil is. Through the readings, evil was really uh, considered to be selfishness. That mm -hmm. when you're putting, just thinking of yourself at the detriment of others, that that's the, the root of, uh, of evil. I see. And that, that, that a real life, the soul-driven life, is to think of yourself in harmony with others, in balance. You know, not that others are more, you know, kind of the, the he said that, you know, the first two commandments, you know, to love your uh, neighbor as yourself. That if you can do that, that's pretty much, uh, you're doing right. a good that's, job. Right, that's certainly what Jesus said was the main thing, was right. the uh, love God and love your neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. Well, what about... Um, Casey's own past lives. Do you get into that at all? Yes, uh, very, very interesting. Um, let me see where to start. Uh, he had had uh, probably his highest life was as this um, high priest in Egypt named Rata. And um, he had achieved a very high level of spiritual attunement, but the Casey material says that that's not enough, that, that the highest lives are when you achieve that level of attunement, but that you share it, that you try to work with others to also bring up their consciousness. So he had had that life as Rata, uh, very elevated. And when he completed that life, he was told, you know, kind of like the Tibetan Rinpoches, that he had completed the learning of this earth. He, he could have not incarnated anymore. He had, learned everything he needed, he could go on to uh, learn in other dimensions. But as often happens, and this is the same with the Tibetan thought, that through the desire, kind of the friends that they have in the earth, they choose to incarnate to help uh, others also uh, follow. So what happens though, when he, when he chooses to incarnate as many souls, you get caught back up in the stuff. So apparently he had a life in early America as this character named Bainbridge, very psychic, because he says those abilities in past lives uh, stay with you, especially the ones that you've attained on the soul level. So he incarnated uh, very psychic, but he used it to be a riverboat gambler and to seduce uh, lots of women. Ooh. So he had lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's got, got building up karma. He's right. got to That's what happened. Off. And so uh, then the, the, the Casey uh, source puts it very concise and said, in this life, he lost. <laughs> he, 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 you know, he backtracked. So that's why apparently when he incarnated as Edgar Casey, he had to go into trance to have the ability that he had as Rata. Rata could access that information directly. So there was a veil put uh, for Edgar Casey. Only through can uh, trance could he have that be because of the karma of Bainbridge. So when he went into trance, he was um, accessing this uh, higher self or, or this soul, his soul, but from an earlier incarnation? Or oh, what? no, he was, um, well, there, there's different, um, uh, places he would access infor this information. The, the primary one was apparently for life readings, he could access what's called the Akashic Records. And it talked about how every moment in time kind of emanates and is written on this kind of ether called Akasha. And that there's certain people that are incarnate that are able to read that and be able to bring that uh, back forward. But when he would give a health reading, what he said is that he was able to access the unconscious mind of the person who was ill and was through their unconscious mind was able to find out everything that was wrong with them. And he said everybody knows exactly what's going on with them unconsciously. And that, that's where they, uh, a lot of times if people pay attention to their dreams, it gives you that information about, you know. And there was a lot of information about dreams and interpreting dreams. Yes. That came through. Yes. So the, the readings, uh, health readings were actually tapping into the individual who was ill his or her own uh, right. subconscious mind right. and, and just playing back that information that's that, right that that person knew for themselves that's very interesting 
Yeah. Um, so he wasn't really, um, he wasn't channeling. You know, he wasn't bringing forth uh, an entity speaking through him. There were times where entities spoke through him, but that was quite rare. The, the predominant uh, experience was that he was accessing this information uh, directly. There was actually a well-known woman in um, England who was channeling an entity named Uvani. And Uvani told this woman in England, I see Edgar Casey in Virginia Beach. I could be his, what he's doing is very difficult. I could be his intermediary as well. So she contacted Edgar Casey, and they debated it for a while what to do, because Edgar Casey could only give two readings a day because it was a uh, demanding physical experience for him. But they ultimately decided to stick with it because uh, Edgar Casey apparently was going directly to the Akashic Records himself. And what Uvani was doing was that you would uh, access Uvani, Uvani would go to the Akashic Records. And so it was almost like it would get a little bit diluted. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that's one of the reasons the Casey material has lasted so long is because I think it's more direct. There's less kind of interpreting that's gone through different uh, levels. Yeah, I've always been kind of suspect about channeled readings of some entity there. I mean, what, how can they possibly, perhaps they do more, know more than people on Earth, but aren't they just uh, right. just some people without bodies? Right. Does that mean they really know anything more than right. anybody that, else? That's exactly what Casey said. He said, just because your grandmother's dead doesn't mean she knows anything more than when she was alive. Huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm speaking with Peter Woodbury, an expert on the material in the psychic readings of Edgar Casey. We're talking about the meaning and purpose of life. Well, Peter, let's attack this head on. What is the purpose of life? There's probably two two parts to that. The, the purpose is always to be helpful to others, you know, to, to live your life just with every opportunity as it presents every day, wherever you are. You know, Casey didn't say you have to go to India to, to realize yourself spiritually. He says, start where you are. There's plenty to do everywhere in the earth. And he says, just day by day, you know, the little things, let them just accumulate. And that's how you, uh, you grow spiritually. But then he says each of us have particular missions, but those particular missions are related to what particular abilities we have. You know, somebody who has a strong uh, musical ability or somebody who's very uh, intelligent with math. You know, whatever those particular abilities are, are the kind of the niches that we can fill in bringing more and more, you know, love, harmony, and peace into the world. So we're, we're to use these abilities. Now, these abilities were developed over many lifetimes, weren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we come here to, to put that to work to help others. Yes. And that would be our dharma, I guess. Is yes. That, mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Yeah. Are we also here to learn and evolve? Yes, mm -hmm. of course. And so what about karma and how does that work into the equation? Well, uh, Casey talks about that there's almost like two cycles. There's the, the wheel of karma and then that we need to move towards this wheel of grace. And that karma, of course, is the, the law of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And as long as we stay on that cycle, that we just kind of stay trapped. And it's through forgiveness. You know, it's through somebody hitting us and us not hitting them back that we, you know, through forgiveness, that we move to this karma of grace. And that's how we just let it, we let it go. And I think we can see in the world where there's... Uh, you know, a lot of war where there's that people are caught up in that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And if we can get to that place where we forgive and let go, that then we, as people, and then hopefully as a whole society, move on to this karma of grace. And, and Casey predicts that we're eventually going to get there. He talks about the book of Revelation is, in a way, kind of a blueprint that we're moving towards this thousand years of peace. But, you know, we're, we're in the throes of you know, all the stuff we need to do before we get there. We kind of have to try everything else before we, <laughs> we try forgiveness. So the idea is to break that cycle of uh, <clears throat> action, reaction. I guess karma really means it's a law of cause and effect. Right. And, uh, well, Casey also, in a way, adds to it. He calls it memory. He says that, that karma is a great, you know, like when you meet somebody in this life, if you have a negative feeling for them, what do you do with that memory? Do you act on it or do you try to let it go? So that's, I guess it connects, but it's just interesting to connect it to, to our memory and then how, what, how we use our will to kind of either perpetuate that memory or do we try to move past it. I'm speaking with Peter Woodbury, a expert on the psychic readings of Edgar Cayce. Well, Peter, how can we uh, determine what our individual purpose is in a particular life, this lifetime? Um, well, there's... Uh, 
there's lots of uh, books written about that topic. I just think it's more simple. I think it's, uh, well, uh, I think the most important kind of spiritual piece to the Casey material is what he calls working with ideals. He says that each and every uh, spiritually seeking person, the most important thing they can do is to decide what their, you know, uh, spiritual ideal is. What are they, um, what moves them spiritually? What are they hoping to attain in this lifetime? What are the, the qualities of the people that they admire? Is it Jesus, Muhammad, you know, whoever, the Buddha, or your parents, or whoever it is in your life? What are those qualities that they have that you aspire to? And he says, write that down. And then he says that that helps you when you make life decisions. You know, will a job, or will a spouse, or will whatever decision, will it bring you closer to that ideal, or does it bring you farther from that? And he says, if we don't do that, we tend to live our lives a little bit more by convenience and a little bit more by desire. So an example would be like somebody who has the, the ideal to be of service to others. When they graduate from college, for example, they might uh, choose a profession, maybe that doesn't pay as well, because it's more in line with their ideal, where someone else who hasn't really thought about it would just say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll go into this job over being a teacher just because teaching pays so lousy. And so that's the um, kind of the way that you first kind of uh, set your, your, your kind of uh, north star. And then um, whatever your abilities are, I think I said this earlier, just whatever, you know, you're good at, you should, you know, that you know you're on, uh, fulfilling your purpose and mission in life should be something joyful. It shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be feeling like, oh, you know, I, I've got to be helping these people. You know, I hate it, but i got to do it. So that's a waste of time. Figure out what you enjoy. You know, do you enjoy playing basketball? Do you enjoy music? And use that as your, you know, um, your life should be an example. You know, through your, your joyousness, that should be a motivating influence uh, for other people. Didn't he also indicate that life should be an adventure? Yes, mm -hmm. it should be. It should be enjoyed. And he said, "Live your life so that I think he put it uh, so that you can tell anybody to go to hell. You know, right. don't live it by other people's uh, ideal or uh, idea of what you should be doing with your life. Live your own life. Make your own mistakes." Yeah, I think Joseph Campbell said, "Follow your bliss." Right. Uh huh. That would be similar. But so. Casey would say, "Follow your bliss. Set your ideal, and then follow your bliss." <laughs> okay. <You're> <laughs> Just making a lot of money might make you happy for a little while, but right. then it uh, really does it. It's not fulfilling, is it? Yeah. Like there was one gentleman who was a stockbroker who got a number of readings. And Casey said, you know, Jesus could have been a stockbroker and held to every ideal of, you know, it doesn't matter what profession in some degree that you're in, but that you can, you know, as a stockbroker, you can, uh, you know, use your resources to help others. And it, it doesn't, uh, whatever, whatever does it for you. Didn't Casey also, um, at one point, he, a lot of his life, I guess, he needed money. He always seemed to be short of money, from yes. what I, I recall. Yes. And uh, didn't he at one time uh, try to use his psychic abilities to find oil? Yes. And what happened? Well, he, uh, he had a very good friend named David Kahn, and um, uh, he wanted, his ideal was to have this hospital here that, we, that he had for two years, but he didn't have the green energy to build that hospital. And so he thought, and, he, and he, you know, he'd always consult the readings. He said, you know, could we, in exploring this oil possibility, you know, could, if we use that money towards the hospital, would that be possible? And the answer came back, he says, as long as everybody involved in that uh, project has the same ideal. Well, how are you going to find that? <laughs> you know? So he went, and they just had it. It was just a mess. They just were digging here. They'd find a little bit. And, and you know, probably everybody had different ideals. Some people were hoping to get the money for, to, you know, run off to Las Vegas and, and have a lot of fun. Right. So, uh, well, wasn't the oil was there, wasn't it? It was just sort of things that got in the way. He said, I mean, he said that uh, there's, a, there's like a mother load of oil in that area. And there's to this day, there's a group um, of uh, ARE people that are looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have the right ideal, I guess? I don't know. <laughs> well, he also said that um, Blackbeard left uh, a stash in this park back here. You know, he's got a buried treasure. It's oh, in this, this park right this park. Mm -hmm. And so there have been people that have been looking for it. No one's found it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like they could use one of those uh, yeah. electric, uh, Met metal, metal detector. detectors and find that. Um, he was told in a reading that one of the reasons that he was always going to struggle with money was that he had in his consciousness the belief that money was bad. You know, kind of like from Jesus' teachings that it's easier for... Uh, uh, 
camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich person to get to heaven. And so that he had that belief. And since he held that, he was unconsciously going to be rejecting money. He didn't want to be wealthy because he felt that that would kind of damn him. And um, so uh, he, his whole life, as you said, he just uh, struggled with money. But the readings made, you know, made it clear that there's nothing wrong with money. It's how you use it. It's just an energy. Well, the rich young man that he was referring to when he said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle uh, had asked Jesus what he needed to do, what he, the young man, needed to do to earn eternal life. Mm -hmm. right? and, uh, and, of course, the bottom line is Jesus said, give all your money away, give it to the poor, and follow me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rich young man uh, didn't do that. But it seemed to me, well, Jesus also said, there's one thing you lacked. He, the young man had followed all of the commandments, and Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. And it seems to me the one thing he lacked was following God, following the right. divine, putting that first, right. which was the first commandment. Yeah, he was attached to money in a way that was so, perhaps blocking So, yeah, his... money was his God rather yeah. than, than uh, God being his God, and uh, therefore uh, it was almost impossible for him to yeah. get through the the eye of the needle. I've been speaking with Peter Woodbury, an expert on the psychic readings of Edgar Cayce. If you'd like to know more about Edgar Cayce and what the institution he founded, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, has to offer, go to www.edgarcasey.com. And Cayce is spelled C-A-Y-C-E. That's edgarcasey.com. C-A-Y-C-E. Well, Peter, this has been a most enlightening conversation. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you.